Hi, everyone. My name is Shai Veshev. I'm the president of University of the People, the first nonprofit, tuition free, accredited American online university, and which opens the door to, of higher education to all those uh, who wish to get a higher education but not necessarily have the right alternative to do so. Today, it is my great pleasure and honor to have Dr. Russ Weiner with us. Russ uh, is not only a friend, he is uh, our Dean of uh, Business Administration, in addition to his uh, daily work. And uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to have you with us, Russ. Thank you for joining. Well, thanks for asking me to do this, Shai. I'm certainly happy to be here today. Thank you again. And why don't we start by you telling us about your history? How, where did you start from and how did you get to where you are today? Okay. Well, again, my name is uh, Russ Weiner. I'm a professor of marketing at the Stern School of Business, New York University, which you can see in the background. Uh, and uh, my job is uh, as part of the marketing department, I'm the deputy chair of the department. And so I have some administrative responsibilities in terms of hiring uh, adjunct faculty to teach classes and doing the whole teaching schedule. But that's in addition to what professors normally do, which is their own teaching, their own research, a variety of other things that make a professor's job an, an interesting one. I, I got my start, uh, actually, when I was an undergraduate at a, at a small private and at the time, men's college in upstate New York called Union College. Uh, and I had a, a number of great advisors in the economics department where I was a major, uh, and they permitted me to do uh, independent studies. And I found out that I really enjoyed doing research, which is basically what a professor does at a research intensive university like uh, NYU. So I decided to apply to doctoral programs uh, from Union and I was accepted and wound up graduating from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, at Carnegie, uh, I had a great, great advisors uh, and I kind of drifted towards marketing. There was no marketing course at Union in my undergraduate days, but I really enjoyed the field of marketing because it kind of brought together two of my interests, uh, one sort of statistics and quantitative analysis and the other being an interest in consumers. And so, that's kind of the way I've done my research over my career is kind of combining uh, interest in consumer behavior with, with uh, analyzing big data sets and trying to understand consumer behavior that way. So uh, I've been interested in, in doing research and teaching now. It's been 44 years since I received my PhD. Uh, I've been a professor at a number of uh, really good institutions, uh, Columbia University in New York, uh, Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, University of California at Berkeley in California. Uh, and finally, I've been at NYU for, for almost 20 years. I've also taught at institutions, you know, pretty much around the world uh, and uh, really enjoy the career of marketing. And so that's kind of how I've gotten to where I am today at NYU. And so uh, it's a great profession being, being a professor uh, and I really enjoy my affiliation with your people. So you have done so much. And in addition to being in universities, you were consulting, consulting and, and you've done a lot. From everything that you've done is in your life professionally, what was the most exciting thing that you have done? I think the, the most interesting and fun job I've had has been to be the, sounds kind of boring maybe, but I've been being the department chair uh, of marketing both at, and, at Berkeley and at, uh, at NYU. Uh, the reason I say that is that I really enjoy working with faculty. I mean, I, academia, probably few of you that are watching this uh, really know the academic industry very well, but it really permits you to do a wide variety of things. Uh, and not only do your research and do your teaching, 
bit of shy, I mentioned you can do some consulting. Uh, and sometimes you get to do some interesting uh, committee work, like develop strategic plans, you know, for institutions. But I really enjoy being department chair because it enables me to work with what we call junior faculty. These are the younger faculty, they're just starting their careers. Uh, and what I really enjoy about, enjoy about being the department chair is helping them get the resources that they need to help them be successful. And so whether it's getting them money to help, uh, to help fund their research or uh, giving them you know, relatively efficient teaching assignments so they have time to do their, their research and kind of working them, with them through the, their academic careers is something that I really enjoy. And I enjoy the field of marketing very much. Uh, and basically I enjoy being in a business school and I enjoy the business of business school. So I really, I really have enjoyed being, being department chair and, and working with faculty. Interesting, interesting. So why you people? Well, uh, the person I'm sharing the screen with is a very persuasive uh, individual. Uh, I was one of the first people on board, uh, I think, the if first. I'm correct, 2009. 2009, uh, and you were the very first. So I was, the, uh, I was in the dean's office at the time, I think, um, and uh, this, this guy shows up you know, saying that he knows a friend of mine named Dan Ariely, and he wants to talk to me about this idea he has for a university. Uh, and, you know, I had plenty to do already. I didn't need to have something else to do. Uh, but the fact is the mission of the UO people is unique. I mean, we're not the only online university as, as, as you all know. Uh, there are certainly a large number of online alternatives, sort of the, the you know, the for-profit uh, online universities. Um, and, and of course, the number of sort of regular universities had online programs as well. But I think, you know, the mission of the UO people is just, is just unique. I mean, the idea of being able to provide a university quality education to people who could not otherwise either afford it or have access to it uh, really excited me. And I can remember one of the first things we did was, I'm sure you remember this, there was a press conference at the UN uh, <laughs> announcing the university. And uh, that was extremely exciting for me. I've been at the UN before, but as a tourist, I'd never been at the UN as a sort of a real participant uh, and I think it just sort of symbolized sort of the global reach that UO people uh, was planning to have. Uh, and uh, again, having this mission of serving uh, students that could not otherwise get a university quality education. And of course, since those days, we've been able to uh, expand the mission in a sense. I don't think in those days we ever thought we'd be able to serve refugee populations, which we do today. Uh, and uh, again, I think it was just the, the really unique mission uh, of the university, uh, as well as Shai's, uh, you know, persuasiveness, shall we say. Uh, <laughs> he didn't physically twist my arm, but he uh, emotionally twisted my arm. Uh, and to tell you the truth, it, it's actually uh, since then been a fairly easy sell to other people. I also helped to recruit the, uh, David Cohen, who is now the, uh, the provost of the university and Alex Tuzilin, who is my colleague at NYU, who's the Dean of Computer Science. Uh, and uh, happy to say that the, the mission of the university, uh, I can't say fulfilled, right? I mean, you're never really completely done, but we're certainly well along our way in, uh, to accomplishing it. No, it, it is, I mean, <laughs> I can just echo every word that you said. You were the first uh, person that I approached. I think it was probably a week or two weeks after uh, we announced the creation of the university. And you brought along, as you said, uh, Alex Trujillin, and uh, you were very instrumental in, in pers uh, pers 
you know, talking to uh, David Cohen and convince him to come along. And yeah, we we had a long way <laughs> since uh-huh. then. Uh, the, the announcement uh, in the UN, I obviously remember, because all the people, we were five people, and they were the entire five people that were involved <laughs> with the university yeah. at the time. It was in May 2009. Um, we started teaching in 2009, and uh, I remember even the early meetings of the deans in your office in, uh, in NYU, and um, how do we create the curriculum and all the, and what courses we should develop and all the challenges that we had at the time. So we went through, we went a long way since then, having now 75,000 students, having, a, as you said, so many refugees, over 6,000 refugees and starting BA in in business administration, well, associate and now BA uh, in uh, Arabic, uh, mainly for refugees. So we did go uh, a long way. Um, So as a dean of business administration, where do you see your people in five years? Well, I think, you know, really it goes back to the mission, Uh, I think that one of the things that really excited me uh, is not not just serving the underserved population, but the potential of giving people education in accounting and marketing and human resources, et cetera. Uh, and then hopefully, while many of them, we, we obviously hope they work for companies, but we also hope that some of them would start their own small businesses. And uh, especially, you know, in, in these many of these countries that are represented uh, in, in the Earth's UO people, you know, population uh, don't have, you know, sophisticated infrastructure for business. Um, and we're hoping they start their own businesses, hire people, uh, and really help to stimulate their own economies. So, you know, Going back to the question, uh, you know, my hope is from the beginning, not only in five years, but in the beginning that we can perhaps at some point do a study and try to estimate what the impact on local economies or country economy has been uh, by our university, because there's, there's nobody serving the kind of population that we are in, in countries like Nigeria, uh, and Haiti and places like that, uh, which are, you know, always countries seemingly in some kind of turmoil, um, but on the other hand, represent opportunities for our graduates to have a real impact, more than they could have in the United States. I mean, we have a lot of students in the U.S., um, uh, but, you know, uh, that's just sort of natural, right? You expect to get a lot, you know, from, from the U.S., um, but I don't think that they'll have the kind of impact on the U.S. economy that a graduate could have on, on the Nigerian economy. So, so I'm hopeful that, you know, in five years, I don't know how many students we're going to have. Um, but I'm really not so interested in the total numbers of students as the impact that our graduates are having. And I think uh, I think I really would like to, to be able to measure that at some point, really proudly say that not only do we have a lot of graduates, but the graduates are having... A, a large impact on the economy of their countries. I, th- I think it, you, you're touching a very important point. We have now thousands of graduates, and right now, 92% of our graduates work. But you know, we should look how we progress and what will be the situation in in a few years from now, and. Our students being being at work or have work is not enough because most of our students work while studying. So saying that our students work doesn't doesn't give the entire picture. The question is whether they have been promoted, whether they found a new job, whether they, as you said, change their life but change their community and their country's uh, situation. Uh, we believe that. Uh, so far, the evidence are great. We have you know, graduates who, who work in amazing companies such as Amazon and Google and the Microsoft and IBM and World Bank and JP Morgan, etc., which is you know great. But we need to see that it continue to be this way, and they will have a, 
and you as a marketing professor, maybe you will do the study to see the impact of our, of our, uh, right. of our work. That's actually what accreditation agency want to see. <laughs> they would love to <laughs> see it as well. So, yeah. It's not that easy to measure, uh, but uh, we'll give it a shot. So it is, it is, you know, because because I keep saying that, you know, what what do you measure? Their position? How do you compare position in different countries? But even worse, how do you measure salaries? You know, making two thousand dollars in the U.S. I wouldn't say that. Every, I mean, two thousand dollars a month, or twenty five thousand dollars a year. I wouldn't say that it's amazing salary. Well, in some countries, it is amazing salary. So, you know, it's like you need to, to put it in the context of where they study. Right. Yeah. We, have, we have students from 200 countries and territories. So it, it is a, quite a challenging job. But going to the current, the current situation, how do you see the world of higher education uh, addressing the, uh, the COVID and the after COVID era? <laughs> Well, I have to say it's certainly been a challenging, uh, I guess, almost 18 months now. Um, you know, as everybody knows, just about every every institution in the world moved to online education, uh, obviously using different technologies. But here at NYU, like many schools, we used uh, Zoom, all right, which is being used for this uh, for this interview. Uh, and I, I think I, I don't think. Let me put another. I don't think higher education will be the same. All right. I think that even the large private universities and the research universities like NYU, uh, but even the Harvards and Stanford's and places like that, uh, I, I think we've learned a lot during these 18 months. I think we've learned that we can deliver uh, a quality education using Zoom. I'm not saying that that everybody liked to do it. I can't say I enjoyed, you know, teaching via Zoom. Um, but I have to say, I don't think the students really suffered that much in terms of education. Uh, now I'm talking about the university level. I'm not talking about say K through 12, which I think is very different. Um, but I think at the university level, I think, I think what we've seen is you can deliver a quality education product uh, online. Uh, and I think that it's going to give universities a lot more flexibility uh, in terms of how they offer their courses. Just to give you an example, uh, I have, a, I am, as I said earlier, I'm in charge of the course scheduling for the marketing department. One of our marketing faculty members just became ill. Uh, so I have to replace him in, in several courses. I found an adjunct professor to be able, that was able to do that, but she works during the day. Uh, and so, we're offering it in the evening remotely. Now, to do that two years ago, no one knew how to do that, okay? Today, everybody knows how to do that, okay? Or if I'm sick or not feeling well, I can say, send out an email to the class. Uh, look, I'm, I'm not feeling well today. I don't wanna teach in the classroom. Let's do this class via Zoom uh, and I can do it from home. And so uh, I think, there's a lot of new flexibility that's been built into this learning process that we've had uh, using, say, using Zoom or whatever online platform is being used. Uh, it may well represent a, a, an opportunity uh, for, uh, for new programs at schools. Um, but I think that, I, I, I just think that the whole world of education, higher education uh, has learned how, how to develop coursework outside of the physical space. And, and I think that's going to have a big impact in the long run on how, how, we, how we run our universities. And, uh, and again, the flexibility that we might have in developing curricula. Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, when I'm talking about uh, COVID and about the effect of the situation on new people, I, I said that before COVID, we were on the margin. Now we became the mainstream. Moreover, we know how to do it, which a lot of university really struggle until they learn how to do it right and to make it interactive and to give the support to the students and playing it in advance and to use really the benefits of flexibility that the, 
that the internet uh, enable enables us so it's it's definitely here to stay yeah. i mean I, i yeah I, i have to repeat i i still i'm sort of old-fashioned i still like teaching in the classroom but you know as i said before it does give you some flexibility and um there are some younger faculty perhaps that are enjoy the technology you can and can develop all kinds of you know supplementary materials and things they can use teaching and so as i said there's a lot of flexibility in this kind of format you know you know the, the recent research says that 75 percent of the students say say that they will continue taking courses online. That does not mean that they will study only online. Those who can have the opportunity of face-to-face, -face, you know, this is great. So, but having the opportunity, having the option to study both face-to-face -face and online, and obviously in our case, for those who do not have the opportunity for studying face-to-face, -face, the online yeah. is there to show that it, it works and it's good and the world know now that uh, yeah. it's a valid uh, alternative and a good quality. I think the challenge for especially the uh, expensive private places like us is getting people to pay, right? Um, because, you know, often they think of uh, University of Phoenix or places like that that are relatively, you know, low cost compared to the, I won't say what price we charge. In fact, I'm not quite sure I know what it is, but, uh, you know, and, and last year, of course, parents got, as many people know, parents got kind of upset at paying You know very high tuition rates for what is essentially what they perceive to be a you know inferior education but i i don't agree that it's inferior although i do want i do acknowledge in some fields it's harder than others to translate to the online format you know for example chemistry right where there's lab work that you know where students benefit from the instructor going around and interacting physically you know with with the students and maybe creative uh areas uh, of education so you know I'm not sure that it's great for for all areas of instruction but i think for the uo people i think what we do i think it it's it it fits in really well and and you know i think that universities who offer online will have to adjust the price because teaching online it depends how you do it can be way less expensive and it should be passed to the students, but that's obviously a different discussion. So yeah. my last question is with your experience uh, and everything that you have gone through in your life, what advice will you give to our students? Well, I think uh, first of all, uh, for those of you that are watching this, uh that are students there may be some potential students that are watching this as well but for those of you that are are, are current students uh i advise you to you know work as hard as you can and get as much as you can out of the program and i think one of the the great things that we have here is that our instructors are approachable uh and it is really much a, a matter of you'll get out of it what you put into it and i think that Uh, if, if you work as hard as you can, I know some of you have very difficult circumstances. I, I don't mean to downplay that. Not only are you working, you might have, might be a single mother or a single parent. Uh, again, you're a refugee and you're looking at this transmission by some miracle or there's some Wi-Fi nearby. Um, so I understand that and, and appreciate that. But, you know, you will get out of it as much as you put into it and, you know, work hard uh you know try to do uh all the assignments to the best of your ability uh and you know talk to the instructors and you know if you have an issue you know or use them for career advice or you know however you think you might be able to use them outside of the classroom uh and you know really get as much out of the uo people experience uh, as you can uh and hopefully <clears throat> You'll be able to leverage the UO people degree, uh, you know, get a good job, uh, and hire people in your community, uh, and maybe other UO people graduates. Uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, we are, shy referred to before, our alumni numbers are growing, growing rapidly. Uh, it would be wonderful for our graduates to hire other graduates. And uh, I think, please, 
think of you as, as alumni and supporters of the university. Uh, try to convince other students that, that we're, you know, a legitimate place. I know that there's always been some questions, you know, about UO people in terms of, well, how can you be tuition free and still be a quality place? Um, but, you know, we are a quality place. We're accredited place and our alumni are doing very well. And so, uh, you know, please keep that up, uh, be successful uh, and work hard. It was really, really, really inspiring. Raj, thank you so much. It was a great interview. And I'm sure that uh, everyone, agree, everyone who got to this point agree with me. Yeah. And uh, if you like this uh, interview, please uh, like it and uh, share it. And so others will enjoy it as well. And uh, thank you for joining. And Raj, thanks again for uh, being with us. Thanks, Shai. Thanks for inviting me. And to all of you out there, best of luck with the program. And if you have any questions, feel free to write me. You can find me on the Stern uh, website uh, and I'd be happy to respond. Thank you. Okay. Bye everybody. Bye.